On October 1978, employees of a power company found the woman's lifeless body next to power lines. It was found in Spokane, Washington, near Division Street and Whitworth Drive. To start the investigation, detectives, deputies and sheriffs from Spokane County arrived to the scene. With the aid of forensic specialists, the scene was captured on paper and prepared for evidence. During the inquiry and autopsy, evidence including potential DNA samples were gathered. Chrisanne Baxter, age 16, was identified as the victim. On September 30, 1978, her mother had reported her as a runaway. It was decided to test the evidence by sending it to the Washington State Patrol Crime Laboratory. The ability to examine DNA was extremely limited in 1978. The samples, according to the investigators, include DNA. The limitations, however, prevented such analysis from being finished. For future analysis, the evidence was safely archived. August 2006, Detective D. Mask of Major Crimes sent the samples back to the crime lab of the Washington State Police for testing since he was aware of the advancements in DNA testing technology. DNA matching between Chris Ann Baxter and an unidentified male was found in the test findings. The combined DNA indexing technique was used to search for matches, but no results were returned for the male profile. The profile was updated in CODIS and added to the National DNA Indexing System in 2014. There, it was compared against each DNA record in the country on a rotational basis. A match was not found, yet, still. The samples were once more given to the Washington State Police Crime Lab by Major Crimes Detective Michael Drapo in 2020 for further analysis. For advanced DNA testing, a part of the forensic material was shipped to Othram's facility in the Woodlands, Texas, in early 2021. A thorough DNA profile for the unidentified male contributor was created by Othram scientists using forensic-grade genome sequencing. In-house genealogy team identified potential relatives of the unknown male, including a direct descendant of the individual who is no longer alive. Detective Michael Drapo of the Spokane County Sheriff received these leads, and he used this brand new knowledge to launch a follow-up investigation. The identified relatives' living family members were subsequently called and questioned. Additional investigation was conducted to try to identify the unidentified male contributor after reference DNA samples were taken, and DNA profiles were created and analyzed by scientists. Keith Lindblom was identified as a possible person of interest after further investigation. His birth year was 1949. A 16-year-old female victim was violently assaulted by Lindblom in 1975, close to the location where Chris Ann Baxter's body was located. Detective Drapeau investigated local enforcement databases and discovered Lindblom was detained and charged in Spokane County for this crime. Lindblom confessed to having intercourse with the juvenile victim and confessed to assault in the first degree. As a result of the ongoing inquiry, it was discovered that Lindblom was not in detention when Creesan Baxter was attacked and killed. Rather, he was released from prison on August 7, 1978. When Detective Drapeau compared the suspect's 1978 DNA sample with one obtained by the Jefferson Davis Parish Sheriff's Office, he discovered that there was 320 times more of a chance that the sample would match Lindblom and his known child than if it had been compared to an unrelated person chosen at random from the U.S. population. Detective Drapeau also discovered that Lynn Blome had a child in Louisiana. Later, relationship testing performed at all Othram suggested a parent-child relationship between Lynn Blome's child and the perpetrator, proving that the male DNA samples taken in 1978 was actually of Lynn Blom. Lynn Blom passed away before the entry of DNA into the CODIS and NDIS databases, which is why a DNA match was not found earlier. After discussing the matter with the Spokane County Prosecutor's Office, Detective Drapeau 
came to the conclusion that, given the available evidence, Lynn Bloom would have been subject to charges and should have been arrested. On April 11, 1981, a fire claimed the life of Keith D. Lindblom. The cause of death was listed as an accident on the death certificate. But he won't be prosecuted for killing Chris Ann Baxter and molesting her. Investigators from the Spokane County Sheriff's Office and other cooperating partner agencies believe this will provide Chris Ann's family and friends with the answers they so desperately need. And at the very least, some measure of solace that the suspect was identified through DNA testing. The Washington State Police Crime Lab, Jefferson Davis Parish Sheriff's Office, and the Spokane County Sheriff's Office are grateful to Othram. There are supportive relatives for Lindblom. The victim's family was patient and helpful throughout the inquiry, while authorities worked patiently and laboriously to find the offender. 73 years old, Gregor and 72 years old, Irma Palasic, both resided in Canberra, Australia, in 1999. Around 9.30 p.m. on the evening of November 6, 1999, two masked males entered into the house on Grover Crescent. Before the man destroyed their home and stole cash and valuables, he shackled the couple with wire ties and beat them brutally. Gregor was able to free himself so that he could dial 911. Irma, however, died on the spot after suffocating on her own blood. Craig Marriott, a detective sergeant, remembered the incident. They were severely beaten, tied with telephone cords, cable ties and duct tape, and the house was looted. After what is believed to have been an hour, Mr. Palasix, who had been in and out of consciousness, was finally able to free himself from his restraints and discovered his wife lying face down in the hallway. She had already passed away when he turned her over and took off her shackles. She had smashed her nose and had effectively drowned in her own blood. The Palasic family had already been the victims of aggravated burglaries in 1997 and 1998, which are believed to be connected to the third fatal break-in according to detectives who first began looking into the case. According to police, someone in Melbourne's Hungarian community may be able to provide crucial information on who is to blame for what occurred to Irma Palasix. Although there was DNA evidence at the crime scene, there wasn't much that could be done because DNA technology wasn't as advanced in 1999. A $500,000 prize was given out in 2012 to anyone who could assist the authorities in getting a successful conviction in the case. Investigators made the decision to re-examine the matter in 2019. DNA technology had improved significantly since then. A DNA match was quickly discovered using the National Crime Investigation DNA database. Investigators found Steve Fabrixi thanks to DNA testing. It took some time to locate Fabrixi but when he was questioned by detectives on September 8, 2023, Fabrixi partially admitted to being involved in the crime. He acknowledged entering the location with the intent to commit the crime. He also revealed information about the break-in that was not well known. 68-year-old Steve Fabrixi from Roville. Melbourne was then subsequently arrested and charged with taking the life of the Irma Palasics. On September 21, 2023, Fabrixi appeared before the Dandenong Magistrates Court to make a bail application. When setting bail, Detective Sergeant Craig Marriott informed the court police that he had serious concerns about Fabrixi, also known as Istvayan Fabrixi, because he is a dual citizen of Hungary and could leave the country if freed. Given that his suspected accomplices are still at large, Marriott claimed they were concerned that the 68-year-old may obstruct witnesses. Although Fabric C has a property of his own in Australia, the court was informed that he has no relatives there and that, after he retires, he intends to return to Hungary, where he owns land. He also has savings of over $250,000, according to Marriott, raising more doubts about his capability to leave Australia. I am also aware that while in jail, 
he told Victoria Police that he intended to hurt himself. He said the same thing to us, asking us to shoot him. While the 68-year-old had no prior convictions for failing to appear for bail, the court heard otherwise. After being found guilty of planning to steal a cargo of smokes, he did serve time in prison from 2010 to 2012. Ultimately, Magistrate Jason Ong denied Fabrixi's request for bail and ordered that he appear in Canberra Magistrates Court on an unspecified date. The family of the Palasik said in a statement that despite over 24 years of suffering, doubt and questioning, they had never given up hope of identifying the perpetrators of this horrific deed. Our grandparents didn't deserve what happened to them. On that night, not only was Irma stolen from us, but Grieger's life was taken as well, and ours would never be the same. This arrest was quite pleasing for the investigators, according to a CT police detective superintendent Scott Marler outside the court. He claimed that the family of Irma Palasik never lost faith, stopped pleading for community support, and consistently works to keep the matter in the public eye. Police, according to Mahler, are still working to find and indict a second person, and they anticipate doing so soon. The $500,000 reward offer is still ongoing, and information received can still be taken into consideration for this reward, Muller said. I am confident it is only a matter of time before we are able to provide full closure for the family and the Canberra community, he added. In addition, detectives unveiled a photograph of a guy they think may know more about what transpired to Irma Palasix. In February 1996, a tragedy unfolded at the Little Champ food store in Orlando, Florida. Terence Piquet, a hard-working man who had recently relocated to Orlando, arrived at the store between 5 and 6 in the morning, preparing for the day's opening at 6 a.m. However, as he went about his early morning tasks, his life was abruptly taken by an unidentified murderer. Terence's tragic end was marked by a chilling act as he was brutally stabbed a shocking 73 times. The case sent shockwaves through the community. With no witnesses to the crime, the Orlando Police Department swiftly launched an extensive investigation. They diligently pursued every possible lead in their quest to uncover the identity of the person responsible for this heinous crime. Despite their efforts, the case went cold for several years. In 2003, the Orange County Sheriff's Office revisited the case, hoping to find fresh leads that might finally bring closure to Terence's family and justice to the community. Advances in forensic technology allowed them to create a DNA profile from the evidence collected at the crime scene. Although this profile helped exclude certain individuals, it did not lead to the identification of the offender, and the investigation again stalled. Frustrated but undeterred, the Orange County Sheriff's Office sought further assistance in 2019 from the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. In a promising development, the department enlisted Othram, a company specializing in cutting-edge DNA testing. Othram used forensic-grade genome sequencing to generate a comprehensive genealogical profile that held the potential to breathe new life into the cold case. Once the genealogy profile was created, the police had a valuable tool at their disposal. They employed forensic genetic genealogy to identify potential suspects who might have a familial connection to the DNA evidence found at the crime scene. Finally, after years of relentless pursuit and technological advancement, a breakthrough was achieved in 2023. The new genealogical leads pointed investigators to 54-year-old Kenneth Stowe Jr., a resident of Eustace, who was already imprisoned without bail on accusations of first-degree killing and robbery with a weapon. Thanks to these groundbreaking advances, Kenneth Stowe Jr. was convicted on all counts in August 2023, marking the end of a long and painful journey for the family of Terence Piquet. Kenneth Stowe Jr. now awaits sentencing bringing justice one step closer to being served.
23 years old, Renee Sweeney, resided in Sudbury in 1998. The city of Sudbury is situated in Ontario, Canada. Renee attended Laurentian University to study music, and she supported herself by working at an adult video store. It suited her schedule and was quiet enough for her to finish her homework when no one was there. On January 27, 1998, Renee was employed at the Parish Street video store. Before 11 a.m., a man entered the shop and walked up to the counter. Renee was stabbed by that man 30 times, and he later stole $200 from the cash. The man then proceeded to clean up in the restroom. The man was taken aback to see Renee was still alive when he left the restroom. She was attempting to use the phone to dial a number behind the desk. Renee then fought with the man and managed to scratch him. But tragically, she passed away from her wounds. The man was observed, leaving the shop in a hurry. A short while later, police came on the site and gathered a significant amount of evidence. The suspect's lightweight windbreaker-style jacket and white cotton gloves were found by Bliss tracking dogs in a nearby wooded area. Additionally, DNA from the criminal was discovered in the restroom of the store and under Renee's fingernails. Witnesses were able to provide detectives with a thorough description of the unidentified man because they saw him running out of the store. He was described as being white in his early 20s with short dark hair weighing 140 to 150 pounds, standing between 5 feet 10 and 6 feet tall and having a slim bill. Additionally, it was assumed that he was wearing glasses. In the hopes that someone would come forward and identify the man, a sketch was circulated around Sudbury. Sudbury police charged 31-year-old John Fetterly with killing Renee on February 11, 1998, two weeks after the crime. It was soon announced that the evidence was insufficient, and the next day they acknowledged their error and freed him. When more and more people learned about the case, the $25,000 reward for information was increased to $30,000. When the National DNA Database was searched, no match was found, even though detectives had obtained the perpetrator's DNA. Officers from Greater Sudbury Police continued to inspect every 30 days. In order to rule out guys in the vicinity, police asked for DNA samples from local men in 1999. It was the largest DNA collection for a single police investigation in Canadian history on December 2, 1999, when hundreds of males provided their samples to Sudbury Police. Renee's case included Michael Wayne McGray, a New Brunswick serial offender who was found guilty of killing seven other persons as a potential suspect on March 23, 2000. However, no solid evidence was discovered connecting him to Renee's murder. The ReneeSweeney.com website was established by Sudbury Police on April 30, 2003, in an effort to gather information about the murder. Renee's family endured a torturous wait for clarification. A song CD titled Remembering Renee Sweeney was issued by her mother Carol Strachan in 2006. In 2017, her sister Kim Sweeney stated that she had little memory of the hours, days and weeks that followed the announcement of Renee's ordeal. When Kim's stepfather called to say that something horrible had happened and she needed to go home, she was at school at the time. Our initial assumption was that something must have occurred to her mother, who suffered from multiple sclerosis. Everything about it felt wrong and I kept wondering why I wasn't being instructed to go to the hospital instead. She claimed that despite this, I immediately got in my car and drove home. Usually, she said, I would have passed Renee's place of employment, but that particular day, I did not. She realized there was something else going on when she arrived at the house and overheard her mother sobbing. Because that's what they initially believed, they informed me Renee had been shot, Kim said. I wondered why we were all just standing about the house, so I went to get my coat. When they told me she wasn't with us anymore, I broke down in tears. Our lives were permanently changed as a result of that day. After that, she claimed, her mom stopped walking altogether. 
Simply put, she could not handle it. After then, her health really declined, and she never fully recovered. Then, in November 2017, her mother passed away without ever learning who had murdered her daughter. I wish she had the chance to finish that book, Kim said. Kim was left with few living family members after Renee's father, who also suffered from multiple sclerosis, killed himself in 1990 and her stepfather also died recently. The idea that her own two small children would never get to meet their aunt, according to her, is what tears her heart the most. She claimed that she would have adored them and that they would have loved her. She ponders Renee's life choices and where she might be right now. Kim remarked, Every day, I just keep having the same questions run through my head, and I still give it some thought. Who would do this for a reason? Why her? Is he still alive in the world? I believe that people simply choose not to participate sometimes. I simply cannot convey how crucial it would be for my sister to finally receive justice, she added. I sincerely hope that anyone with information or if anything he or she remembers will be aware that the case has not been solved. In 2017, the Greater Sudbury Police Service revealed their collaboration with Virginia-based Parabon Nanolabs, a DNA phenotyping technology company. Snapshot, a composite sketch of the offender created with DNA technology, was made public on January 23, 2017. The term describes a method that, using DNA evidence, can forecast a suspect's physical characteristics. The composite has given police more precise information about the suspect's physical characteristics, according to Greater Sudbury Police Constable Megan O'Malley. We are aware of his European ancestry and pale skin color. He has brown or blonde hair, blue or green eyes, and possibly freckles. Following the image's resurgence of public interest in the case, from 2017 to 2018, Sudbury Police received 360 tips from the general public. About 200 of the potential suspects from those tips were ruled out by DNA testing or other methods. In 2018, Detective Sergeant Robert Weston, the case's principal investigator, stated it is surprising and frustrating at the same time that this problem has remained unanswered for 20 years. Additionally, he acknowledged that it is challenging to look into a crime that occurred so long ago, but he is committed to moving the investigation ahead and finally apprehending the offender. You nearly develop a relationship with the victim as you become more involved in a case like this. Despite the fact that Renee is the main focus, I am still optimistic that the suspect will be found. By the end of 2018, detectives had investigated thousands of tips and excluded 1,800 individuals. 20 years had gone by. Most individuals believed that the suspect would never be apprehended. Therefore, it came as a surprise when Sudbury police reported that they had detained and accused 38-year-old Robert Stephen Wright with murdering Renee on December 12, 2018. His genetic makeup matched that of the offender. At the time of the murder, Wright was a Lockerbie composite school student, 18 years old. While employed as a lab technician in North Bay, he was arrested. At the time of the Wright's arrest, Bliss Chief Paul Peterson said, Over the past 20 years, and until now, we have been actively looking into information and tips. Since then, Wright has appeared in court several times. He was denied bail in March 2019 and again in May 2020. Wright's trial will take place in Sudbury, according to a judge's decision on October 8, 2020. This came after his attorneys requested a change of venue, stating that it would be challenging to find an impartial jury in the city due to years of media coverage. On February 21, 2023, the Stephen Wright's trial finally began. Wright denied any knowledge of the crime. He claimed that on the morning of January 27, 1998, he was completing an exam at Lockerbie High School in Sudbury. Wright claimed to have been dressed for the chilly morning in a teal jacket, a long-sleeved t-shirt, jeans, gloves, 
and running shoes. He decided to visit the adults' only video store on Paris Street after his exam because he had some free time. Prior to entering the store, Wright claimed he was unable to see inside, given that the doors were hidden and dark. When Wright initially walked into the store, he saw video boxes scattered all over the carpeted floor. He testified in court. Subsequently, he stated that he observed something had spilled onto the floor, but admitted that the possibility of it might being blood didn't come across his mind at the moment. Still processing what he was seeing is actually real. He entered the store more and farther till he came across Rene Sweeney's body on the ground. Wright testified to the jury that he approached Sweeney's body to check for a pulse and to see if she was still breathing. This was a technique he claimed to have learned while a Boy Scout. He added that after giving Renee a shoulder shake with his right hand, he inquired about her safety. However, he finally claimed that he was unable to identify any movement, respiration, or pulse. Wright claimed that he abruptly pulled away from an overpowered Renee. He admitted to the court that he was alarmed when he saw that his jacket was covered in blood. He stated in court that I fled because I was afraid. I was a foolish child and I wish I had stayed. Wright said I was utterly overwhelmed at that time, so I am at a loss for words as to what was going through my head. All I wanted was to leave. When Wright stood up from the body, he had to steady himself and he took a hold of something but he can't recall what, he told the jury. Wright was questioned if he knew that a fingerprint matching his DNA had been discovered on a cash tray on the counter. Wright claimed he was unaware of the tray and added that he wasn't sure what he had grasped onto to keep himself from falling. Wright claimed he did not lift the cash tray's money clips or steal anything from the place of business. He claimed that he next recalls leaning down grabbed his teal jacket and gloves and sprinting away. When questioned, Wright gave his reasons for throwing away his jacket and gloves. That's when I understood I'd fled a crime scene and I was scared I would be involved. The worst choice I ever made in my life was to run, even though I'm not even sure if I was aware of it. Wright claimed that following that, he briefly considered going to a friend's house but ultimately opted against it since he did not want to involve anyone else. He claimed that after leaving the downtown Sudbury city centre mall, he rode the first bus back to Val Caron. When Wright got home that afternoon, he claimed to find it empty. He testified before the court that he never told anyone what had occurred, not even his parents. My only desire was to put the whole event behind me and move on. It caused a lot of trauma. I didn't want them to worry, and I was too embarrassed of running as well. Wright's story had many contradictions. It did not explain how his DNA ended up in the restroom and under Renee's fingernails. The way his fingerprints were discovered beneath the cash box was also left unanswered. In addition, no one else's DNA was discovered at the crime site, and no one else was observed there. He was convicted of every accusation against him on March 29, 2023. After just more than a day of deliberation, the jury returned their decision in the Sudbury courthouse. People hugged each other while crying, and a shout came from the courtroom's side as the Sweeney family was setting. As they witnessed their 43-year-old son being led out of the courtroom by police, Wright's parents, who were also in tears, offered a timid wave and his mother wept. Family friend Kelly Irvine told reporters they were overjoyed and happy with the jury's verdict, with Renee's sister Kim standing next to her smiling. Kelly Irvine remarked that after what unfortunately occurred 25 years ago, Renee Sweeney received justice tonight. On June 29, 2023, Robbie Gordon will impose a sentence on Stephen Wright, age 43. A sentence of 25 years is anticipated. Kim, a sibling of Renee, got the final word in her victim statement. Have you experienced the loss of your closest friend? I have. Furthermore, my family's experience with losing Renee has been an absolute torture for which there are no words in the English language. To be reminded of the cruelty 
I had to look at that jacket, which was stained with my sister's blood. I'm pleading with the judge to impose the harshest punishment on him. A quarter of our lives have been lost. He ought to be granted 25 years to reflect on his actions.